located to the right of his auditorium, the people. Sitting from the sixth to the tenth row, must evacuate through the main door. Once outside the building, we must keep going to the meeting room to the right in the middle of the section. Between this building and the TV area. If someone cannot move quickly and easily, they must relocate themselves close to the columns, which are indicated as low risk spots. Follow the instructions of the brigadier at all times. Thank you for listening. Bien, muy buenos días tengan todas y todos. Es un verdadero placer tener aquí esta plática entre colegas y amigos y también es histórico porque fuera de la maestra Ellen Emilson, quien nos acompañó como colega muchísimos años aquí en el entonces L, no había venido ningún otro nativo de Islandia a estas tierras mexicanas, a esta escuela. Entonces, pues es un gran gusto tener eh, a, es, esta mañana a Runa Hegi Dignison, que nos va a hablar de la, la escritura creativa y nos, nos dará muchísimas ideas para poder emprender esto. Sobre todo nosotros tenemos ya, contamos con un centro de escritura académica en la escuela que está haciendo sus pininos en en inglés para apoyar a los alumnos de maestría y doctorado. Entonces, pues eh, también la escritura creativa no está peleada con eso. Y nos acompaña en la mesa el maestro Elif Lara Astorga, de ese colega del CEPE, también aquí muy cerca. Y por supuesto, quien eh, empezó a generar esta, esta sinergia de tener esta plática con nos el día de hoy, la maestra Elin Emilson. Entonces, pues los dejo ya eh, a disfrutar esta conferencia y hope you enjoy it and very welcome all of you. Thank you. no, 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 una hora es, de conferencia y... Es, sí, como 40 y 60 minutos de conferencia. Oh, pero vine con una hermina, con la hermina. Ahí la... Hijo. A ver, Cacho. Sí, como lo mío va a ser como cinco... 10 minutos de presentación, 5 minutos, uh -huh. luego él empieza con 40, luego yo eh, te paso aquí la palabra, como uh -huh. 10, 15 minutos, y luego preguntas al público y preguntas del YouTube, si hay 10, 20 minutos de plática. Sí, por favor. Sí. Sí. Bueno, entonces, eh, si ¿sí me escuchan, voy a, a dar inicio. 
Eh, como, bueno, algunos me conocen, soy Ellen Emilson y trabajé en el CELE del 80, de 1981 a 1992 y luego del 2002 al 2005. Si bien esos años se pierden en la memoria histórica, permanecen vivos en la mía, al representar no solo mis años más vibrantes, sino también mi formación sólida en lingüística aplicada. De algún modo siento que nunca me he ido, pues sigo con amistades muy queridas y celebro todo lo que ha ocurrido y que ha hecho el CELE y ahora la ENALT, un verdadero referente para las culturas y las lenguas internacionales. Y, y también nacionales, porque tienen el programa de Nahuatl, ¿no? Por eso, cuando me contactó Runar, mi paisano, inicialmente solo para que nos conociéramos, se me ocurrió que sería interesante organizar una conferencia para que él pudiera transmitir ideas desde el islandés. La ENALT me pareció un lugar idóneo pues tiene clases de sueco y alemán y al ser el islandés una lengua emparentada, pensé que podría ser de interés para ese público y al público en general. Además, ya que Runar es también traductor, pensé que podría ser de interés para los alumnos de lo, y profesores de la carrera de traducción. Por eso me acerqué a la directora del ENAL, quien, a, Carmen, a la doctora Carmen Contioc, quien recibió con entusiasmo la propuesta y a quien estoy sinceramente muy, muy agradecida. Realmente es un gusto y un honor poder seguir teniendo contacto con una institución que fue mi hogar y mi alma madre. Ahora paso a presentar el evento. Runar hablará en inglés, pero espero que se pueda entender con las diapositivas. Además, le pedimos que, que hable más o menos. Uh -huh. Eh, luego contaremos con la presencia de Eli Lara, colega del Centro de Enseñanza para Extranjeros, quien hará comentarios a la presentación de Runar en español. Pero ahora ya vivimos en un mundo multilingüe y vamos a estar campechaneando, como quien dice, entre el español, el inglés. Eh, vean los que están aquí, si no ha, son, digamos, su inglés no es tan fluido. Recuerden que esta es una buena práctica de listening comprehension, ¿no? Y también ahí tienen sus, sus, eh, el, los volantes, que también sirve de reading comprehension. El título del evento, que se como se anunció, es Teaching Creative Writing in a Threatened Language, o sea, escribir eh, la, la escritura, crea en, la enseñanza de la escritura creativa en una lengua amenazada, que para mí es como terrible, porque para mí el islandés es como mi, mi, de donde para mí es mi fuente, ¿no? De decir las lenguas pequeñas también tienen un lugar fuerte en el mundo. Y por eso yo trabajo mucho con lenguas indígenas y les digo, si el islandés puede, ustedes también, ¿no? Que en este caso es la lengua islandesa, una lengua conocida como las más antiguas vivas, a, aparece mucho eso, las diez lenguas más antiguas en, en memes, ¿no? En, es decir, que ha permanecido relativamente sin cambiar en los últimos mil años. Pero como Runar no se explicara, el panorama está cambiando radicalmente y de eso es lo que va a hablar. Entonces presento a, a Runar. Él es Runar Helke Vignison. Como saben, lo, el sistema de apellidos es, o como no saben quizá, es patronímico. O sea que siempre somos hijos de nuestros padres y no heredamos apellidos. Entonces su papá se, llama, se, llamó, se llamaba Vigni. Es profesor de escritura creativa en la Universidad de Islandia y ha dirigido el programa desde que se fundó en 2008. Es autor de ocho libros de ficción y ha traducido obra de numerosos autores reconocidos como William Faulkner, Emitán, J.M. Coetze, Chumpa Lahiri. Sus cuentos cortos han sido traducidos a varias lenguas. El proyecto más reciente de Vignison es una colonia de una colección de cuentos cortos de alrededor del mundo que él coeditó con dos de sus colegas e incluye dos cuentos de México. 
Vic Nison ha recibido varios premios por su trabajo, tanto de sus obras de ficción como por sus traducciones, entre los que figuran el Premio de Traducción de Islandia y el DB Premio Cultural y el Premio de Vendedores del Libro Islandés. Y eh, presento de una vez a Elif. Eh, la idea justamente es eso, como ir haciendo un diálogo que no sea solo el profesor, sino pasar también desde la óptica de, de alguien como, como el IF, que es maestro en letras mexicanas por la Universidad Autónoma de México. Actualmente está adscrito al Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas y al Centro de Enseñanza para Extranjeros, ambos de la UNAM, donde realiza labores editoriales y docentes. Asimismo, fue profesor del Instituto Matías Romero de la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores. Sus artículos tratan sobre las literaturas mexicana y latinoamericana. Además, ha dictado ponencias sobre el mismo tema en congresos nacionales e internacionales. Junto con Gustavo Jiménez, preparó la edición crítica de Poesía Reunida de Amado Nervo con Azul Taunam 2010, y sus más recientes capítulos de libros se han enfocado en la narrativa de Leonora Carrington, la poesía mexicana del siglo XIX y la obra policiaca de Francisco Hagenbeck. Entonces, pues, sin más preámbulo, eh, vamos a escuchar a, a Runa. Gracias, Elin. Um... I'm sorry I can't speak in your wonderful language, but I did understand a little bit of what you were saying, at least about me. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, it's a thank you for the introduction, Elin. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to uh, be here and an honor to be invited to speak to you, here, to you here at the National School of Languages, Linguistics and, and Translation at UNAM. And by the way, <clears throat> UNAM, the un enrollment at UNAM is equal to, almost equal to the whole population of Iceland. <laughs> We are uh, three, 390,000 people in Iceland. Uh, and uh, Mr. Google told me yesterday that there were 342,000 students enrolled at your university. That's huge. <laughs> and I feel very small here. <laughs> But uh, I would like to thank you, thank uh, Carmen Pontiop, the director of the National School, for having me here and inviting me here, and Elin for organizing this as well and Eli Flara Astorka to, to be here to comment on what, whatever I have to say. By the name, by the way, your middle name, Lara, is that how you pronounce it, Lara? Yes, yeah? that's correct. My, my mother's name is Laura. Laura. Which is a female name in Iceland. So. Oh, okay. But Lara, there is a difference. So. <laughs> yeah, it's different. Eli? Yeah. Eli in Iceland. Yeah. In, in, in Icelandic means the immortal one. <laughs> <laughs> so you will be here a long time uh, yes. <laughs> commenting on my, my lecture. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, Mr. Google also told me that uh, there are around uh, 110 million people in Mexico that speak Spanish. Um, and that it's more than one fifth of uh, of all people who speak Spanish in the world. So, as I said, um, with Icelandic, with speakers of Icelandic, around three hundred and ninety thousand at most. Uh, I'm I'm very small in this context. Um, am I speaking too fast? Is it okay? You. It's good. Yeah. And by the way, English is not my first language either, so don't be shy. <laughs> We're all trying to deal with it. Uh, my presentation will be in two parts. First, I'll, I'll talk about uh, teaching creative, language, creative writing in a, in a threatened language in Iceland nowadays. 
And uh, then uh, I will read from a creative piece um, where the Icelandic language laments its state. So um, the Icelandic language is the narrator of that piece. Well, um, according to the website Ethnologue, there are 3,593 3, stable languages in the world and 3,072 endangered ones. That's, that's to say that over 40% of the world's languages are endangered. Um, while my mother tongue, Icelandic, or Íslenska, as we call it, is not classified as an endangered language yet, some experts predict that the Icelandic language will vanish from the face of the earth in the 21st century. That would be the end of a language which has been spoken on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean since the settlers brought it along from Scandinavia, in some cases via the British Isles, 1100 years ago. For the first few centuries, Icelanders shared this language, often referred to as Old Norse, with the people of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark which meant that Icelandic poets would impress the kings of Scandinavia with their skaldic poetry, some of which still exists. At the end of the 14th century, linguistic paths diverged, causing somewhat of an existential watershed. The Scandinavians no longer understood the Icelanders, which left the islanders as the only speakers of this tongue in the whole world. Some have claimed, somewhat bitterly, that this watershed was more tragic than the loss of independence to Norway in the year 1262. Why? Because Icelanders had only themselves to talk to. And that's still the case. Even though the population has grown rapidly in the past century, we still don't reach half a million, which makes Iceland one of the smallest speech communities in the world. Scholars believe that historical writing for Norwegian kings was a kind of industry in Iceland until around the year 1400. They would write poetry for the kings. The sagas of Icelanders, prose narratives about events in Iceland and Norway, especially in the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries, make up the bulk of the literary heritage produced during that period. A lot of it has survived famine and primitive houses, and can still be read by Icelanders in the original, even though some of the vocabulary now looks quaint. Sagas have been required reading in elementary schools and high schools in Iceland to date, which means that, um, that to an extent they are the basis for literary output in the country even today. By the same token, they are the database of the Icelandic language. One of the manuscripts that has survived and is still required reading is Norris Edda, sometimes called the Prose Edda, compiled in the 13th century. It contains much of what is known about Nordic mythology, but big sections of it are devoted to instructions on writing poetry. For a long time, it served as a textbook in creative writing, probably one of the first of its kind in the world. While Icelanders don't write poetry of that nature anymore, Snorri's Edda stands as a landmark in our literary history 
laying the foundations for a creative program that wasn't established until the 21st century. Icelanders have long defined their identity by the language. The Nordic Prize winning poet Snorri Hjartarson captured this in the first line of a 1949 poem. He said, country, nation, language, a trinity, true and one. These three things were tied together. The poem was written at the peak of Icelandic nationalism, only five years after the country, country gained full independence from Denmark. At the time, it was an accepted truism. Everyone believed that the language was a defining feature of Icelandic identity and that the essence of Icelandic culture was bound up in the language. This belief was undisputed until the turn of the century, reverberating most memorably in the rhetoric of President Vigdís Fimbúadóttir at the end of last century. Since then, much water has flowed under the bridge. Around 20% of the country's inhabitants and now non-native speakers of Icelandic, the number of immigrants and international residents having skyrocketed in our context by our measure in the 21st century. Not to mention uh, millions of tourists that now visit every year. As a result, the country has become multilingual and multicultural. While Poles make up the largest ethnic group, English is the most widely used interlanguage. The boom in tourism after the 2008 financial crisis, when all our banks collapsed, and the advent of all kinds of digital platforms in English, easily accessible to young and old, further buttresses the Anglo-Saxon language. In kindergartens, toddlers of Icelandic-speaking parents have recently been observed playing in English. Teenagers and many adults tend to throw in a lot of English words. I don't know if you do that uh, in Spanish, with your Spanish. Um, an abundance of loan words is considered to be a sign of a language in trouble, since it means that the language is not being fully acquired by the youngest generation. The oldest generations, which are as a rule not fluent in English, complain that they can't communicate in Icelandic at restaurants and stores in downtown Reykjavik anymore. Reykjavik is our capital. No wonder that recent research questions the link between land, people, and language. Icelanders are now more ambivalent when it comes to requiring immigrants to learn Icelandic, some demanding that the government provide free access to language courses while others consider language requirements heavy-handed and encroaching on people's right to use the language of their choice. There are even those who find insisting on one national language overly national, nationalistic. While I, as the long-time director of the Creative Writing Program at the University of Iceland, do not wholly endorse the nationalistic allegation. I am aware that it's no longer self-evident to run the nation's only creative writing program in Icelandic. It entails excluding non-speakers of Icelandic, which may be considered an undemocratic gesture in light of the current composition of the nation. The English department at the University of Iceland offers the odd workshop, but to, but to be admitted to a full-fledged creative writing program, a non-speaker of Icelandic would have to go abroad. One may argue that in an ideal world, every citizen has a right to seek further education in his or her native language, 
or at least in a lingua franca, which would force Icelandic society to adjust to the multicultural makeup of the nation. In the age of identity politics, such a demand may seem natural and fair, notwithstanding the fact that Iceland is still defined by law as a monolingual society. What's more, the laws entrust the government with ensuring that Icelanders can use their language in all fields of Icelandic life. Everyone should also be able, enabled to learn Icelandic. In recent years, the number of students studying Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland has actually gone up considerably, while the number of Icelandic students enrolled to study Icelandic language and literature has gone down drastically. That said, nurturing the Icelandic language can hardly be deemed an unworthy or suspect endeavor in its context. Every group needs a language to communicate in, to enjoy and contribute to the culture its members share, and therefore must nurture it in order for it to meet the demands of the day. There is nothing inherently wrong in that undertaking. On the contrary, it's a necessity, for otherwise any language is bound to stagnate and deteriorate. The cultivation of one language does not necessarily come at the expense of another, and Icelandic students certainly learn other languages as well. Nurturing one's mother tongue is also an existential issue for its deterioration or even the threat of imminent extinction robs its speakers of an instrument which is crucial to their well-being in a particular environment, distancing them at the same time from a lot of what is theirs and making them feel bereaved in the process, even more mortal. The question... Uh, the question that many speakers and writers of Icelandic face now is whether to suffer the slings of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing them end them as Hamlet put it so famously being a figure in a Nordic legend which Shakespeare made use of. Let's now look at the teaching of creative writing in Icelandic. The first creative writing workshop in Iceland was offered in 1987. In, in 2002, a minor was introduced at the undergraduate level, but a full-fledged major wasn't established until 2008, when I was hired. A master's program was founded in 2011. In 1987, and actually also in 2011, it seemed a given that all writing in the workshop would be in Icelandic, the official language of the country. The decision wasn't challenged back then and still hasn't been seriously challenged, although more and more students seek permission to hand in assignments in English. We rarely allow that since we are part of the Department of Icelandic. Hence, it's the only creative writing program in the world that is dedicated to writing in Icelandic. In other respects, the program is more international, being modeled on the American approach, most notably the one associated with the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Unlike most programs in the English-speaking world, where students enroll in fiction, poetry, or non-fiction program, we offer a program that is not divided by genres. Our students have to attend workshop, workshops in more than one literary genre, which means that they can only specialize to a limited degree. This has turned out to be a good thing, the cross-pollination enabling participants 
when reads their texts in the chosen genre. The structure of the program has also helped us avoid one of the pitfalls of writing of writing programs, that is, churning out writers who are all cast in more or less the same mold. The environment in which the Icelandic Creative Writing Program operates, as outlined above, tends to highlight its role in nurturing and maintaining the Icelandic language. The program is fully financed by the Icelandic government. We are also under the auspices of the Department of Icelandic and Cultural Studies, as I said before, which, more, which, would, which, would, excuse me, which would make it almost sacrilegious to teach in any other language. A decision to start teaching in English would signal a radical change of direction, one which would be likely to cause an uproar in the country. Although academic courses are frequently conducted in English at Icelandic universities to accommodate exchange students. Such a departure would mean that an Icelandic mindset would be exchanged for an English one in our literature. We have already seen that happen in the music industry, <clears throat> where a lot of Icelandic musicians, among, among them Björk, which you may know, now write their lyrics in English, which raises questions about authenticity. These lyrics often don't sound Icelandic at all. They are, after all, written in a second language, as would be the case with writers. The hugely important example of Halldór Laxness, Iceland's Nobel Prize laureate in literature, should be kept in mind. During a period when some of his colleagues had, had considerable success writing in Norwegian or Danish, he chose to stick to Icelandic. And since then, most Icelandic authors have followed suit. Had Laxness received the Nobel Prize for writing in Danish, we might not have seen the thriving literary scene in the Icelandic language that we have enjoyed for the past century. The fate of the Icelandic language in North America, in US and Canada, also serves as a warning. Around 20% of the Icelandic nation is, is estimated to have emigrated to the plains of the US and Canada in the early 20th century. And most of them were nationally minded, determined to keep speaking the native tongue in the new country. They published books and newspapers in Icelandic and founded schools where their kids were taught in Icelandic. A century later, there are very few speakers of Icelandic left in North America, and no one uses it for daily communication. All that is left in daily usage among the descendants are a few Americanized words. The environment in which the immigrants found themselves demanded that they adopt the English tongue. Today, Icelanders are also surrounded by speakers of English, both in the real world and in cyberspace. So what does it mean to teach almost solely in Icelandic? It means, among other things, that our students draw primarily on the Icelandic literary and cultural heritage that comes with the language. Language is an archive that collects the wisdom, the traditions, the sayings of its speakers. Icelandic reaches all the way back to Norway in the ninth century, so there's a great deal of immediately accessible history at hand. In fact, the entire history of settlement in our rugged and somewhat inhospitable island. Many expressions in daily use are derived from the Icelandic sagas. There is even a neighborhood in Reykjavik, our capital, in which all the streets, street names are drawn from characters in the sagas. 
these characters are still among us, as, as are the vivid characters of the Nobel laureates novels. Teaching in Icelandic also means bending your tongue around long, ancient words and phrases, which mean, which can create an odd tension between past and present, especially when modern speakers don't know the origins of idioms. It means conjugating verbs and declining nouns in every sentence, often in quite intricate ways, for every noun can have 16 different forms. It means that you need a special keyboard in order to be able to use the letters that are unique to Icelandic. Technically, technically it means that you go the extra mile, so to speak, and that's exactly where Icelandic has fallen short. Digital support is so far insufficient, which experts consider to be a dangerous sign because it means that the language can't be used in all fields of daily life. What is more, teaching in Icelandic also means that practically no one in the world understands your writing. You might as well write in a secret code. If you want to reach, some, reach a wider audience, you need to translate your work or, as is most often the case, find someone to do it, which is not always easy. In Iceland, you are not likely to sell more than at most 15,000 copies of a book. In fact, you are more likely to sell fewer than 500 copies, and you may not even exceed 100 copies, although we publish more books per capita than most nations, proportionally. If you're going to make a living as an Icelandic writer, you had better garner some of the subsidies handed out by the government to support writing in Icelandic. Now the government has started subsidizing publishers as well to make sure that books are published. But most importantly, for a native speaker of the language, teaching in Icelandic means, depending on how one defines the Icelandic language nowadays, it means or should mean that Icelandic students can be authentic in their writing. They have direct access to their inner person as direct as one can have language-wise. In my opinion, based on trying to master four second languages, you can never fully represent yourself and your culture by means of a second language, one that you have to learn from scratch after you have passed the natural age of language acquisition. A first language is in your blood and bones, but when using a second language, you will always be a bit removed from the reality you're trying to deal with. Here I side with the Kenyan author, Nguki Vachionko, who claims that the choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to the people's defini definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment. On the other hand, I take issue with a Nigerian author, Chinua Achipi, who resorted to English in order to reach a wider audience, maintaining that one of the best things the colonizers had left behind was a language that united people and nations. It would be interesting to hear what you think of that. Of course, you can adjust a language to a new environment over time, like the first settlers of Iceland must have done. But then the long history of a native tongue is lost if it's a case of overwriting a pre-existing language. A whole world is even lost. Ironically, our students are still required to read quite a bit in English, since everything they need isn't 
available in Icelandic translation, which means that they have to read the second language, one which most of them don't have a perfect understanding of, and therefore read with an accent, so to speak. In the process, they need to appropriate what they have read in the foreign language, make it their own, as the Icelandic word for translating signifies thida. It's related to the word thjóð or nation. There, the translation process is actually beneficial and helps them avoid copying another culture without self-reflection and cognitive content. Being Icelandic is rather unique, as our numbers and location suggest. It entails a special relationship with the world. For one thing, we are islanders located in the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and America. We have had to be self-reliant to a great extent through the ages since we are so removed from others. At times this manifests itself in nationalistic discourse as well as weariness of the foreign, even racism, latent as such leanings may be. For decades, the US Navy had a base in Iceland and during part of that period, the Icelandic government introduced severe restrictions on the mingling, their mingling with Icelanders, especially the women. This kind of distrust of the foreign still appears in various protective measures, import restrictions on meat, subtitled movies, this inclination for selling resources such as land rights to foreigners, even overly generous praise for the domestic literary output. At the same time, Icelanders are prone to an inferiority complex which sometimes actually takes the form of megalomania, the yearning to be a player on the big stage, something that may have contributed to the spectacular crashing of the Icelandic banks in 2008. As contradictory as it may seem, it also rears its ugly head as a cultural cringe often manifesting itself in succumbing to foreign influence. Many stores and restaurants now boast English names because that's considered more business savvy than the quaint and often long Icelandic names. All these issues will be ingrained in our admissions committees and cannot be easily uprooted. We want the members of the admissions committees to be aware of them and be critical of them. Otherwise, they may affect the way they handle applications from non-native speakers of Icelandic, few as they may be. So far, we have only had two applicants who aren't native speakers of Icelandic in the creative writing program. Both are of Polish descent and were, after some deliberation, accepted on the grounds that their texts were promising and that their command of Icelandic seemed good enough to enable them to work with it in a creative way. We also hoped that they might become our first immigrant writers writing in Icelandic, as immigrant writers have been conspicuously absent from Icelandic literature through its history. Where is our Amy Tan, our Sandra Cisneros, our Eva Hoffman? Some of us have asked in recent years, bemoaning the lack of such a valuable perspective. Our Polish applicants are first generation immigrants who studied Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland. Their Icelandic isn't faultless, but they are able to write a coherent literary text despite making some grammatical mistakes. When asked what kind of writers they would like to be, become in Icelandic, both replied that they wanted their texts to be in perfect Icelandic, which means that they have to rely on copy editors who are likely to affect their expression in some way. 
I have drawn their attention to the Polish Australian author Anya Wolwicks, who has made a name for herself by writing in broken English. In that manner, Wolwicks has managed to convey the view of the immigrant, the other in Australian society. Would our students like to take on a similar, similar role? No, they wanted their text to be in perfect Icelandic, unlike some, some Icelandic students. They may have sensed the emphasis on writing pure Icelandic, which still prevails in published texts, despite the copious borrowed words often found in spoken Icelandic nowadays. They may not want to be the immigrants in the Icelandic literature, fearing that what they have to offer would be devalued, not taken seriously, what with all the animosity immigrants sometimes suffer in this day and age all over the world. They may want to keep their dignity by presenting this, themselves as fully assimilated Icelanders instead of being marginalized. Still, they cannot escape their origin and the way it has shaped them. They were born in another country and their mother tongue belongs to a language group that is non-Germanic, unlike Icelandic. Amy Tan resents being categorized as a representative of all people of Chinese descent in America. She wants to be seen as just a writer. Yet, she has made her name through writing about Chinese immigrants in America. Philip Roth, who was Jewish, first found his subject matter when a friend pointed out to him who he should write about Jews in America. Should our students write about Poles in Iceland? What they decide on remains to be seen, but so far they have expressed strong desire to write about Icelandic nature reveling in all the words about natural phenomena found in the Icelandic vocabulary. There they had for the core of Icelandic identity, the affinity with nature. While they enjoy using these words, their view of Icelandic nature is notably different from a native Icelander's. Their eye sometimes lingers on things that the Icelander may find too commonplace to notice, making their perspective an invaluable asset. Our Polish students have to find a voice in Icelandic that will be accepted by the literary community if they are going to get published. They have been published, by the way. They don't want the, to alienate Icelandic readers who are not used to reading broken Icelandic. I have no doubt that immigrant writers such as our students can enrich and even renew Icelandic literature. By Icelandic literature, I refer to literature written in Icelandic. This definition has been uncontested so far, but now we may have to ask ourselves whether literature written, in, written by Icelandic citizens who wish to write about things Icelandic in another tongue can also qualify as Icelandic literature. We may end up with two categories of Icelandic literature, that is literature written in Icelandic and literature written in other languages in or about Iceland. Our program has not been willing to accept such a division, but may have to consider it in the near future if the center cannot hold. There are no plans to discontinue the creative writing program at the University of Iceland. There is a consensus in the literary world that it has renewed Icelandic literature, turning out a number of award-winning authors and enriching literary life in general through all kinds of acti activities. There are no plans to discontinue speaking Icelandic either. In fact, the Icelandic government has just finished building a specially designed house for the Icelandic language, which is meant to accommodate the, de the Department of Icelandic, including the creative writing program, as well as our, our old saga manuscripts. The official line is to keep up the good work, Icelandic shall prevail. Subsidies to support Icelandic publishers 
have been introduced, as I mentioned before, as well as special grants for writers of children's books, all in the belief that increased production is necessary to maintain the language. The other day, the happy news was released that Icelandic would be the second language that the artificial intelligent model chat GPT uh, will be developed in, which could be of eno enormous help to our language. So everything is full speed ahead, it seems. But doubts linger in the minds of many, for Icelanders at large seem to be going in the opposite direction. Of course, language is organic, constantly adapting to a fluid environment, but do, do they have to mutate into something totally different in the process? There are indications that the more foreigners speak a language, the more simplified it becomes. And the more simplified, the more likely it is to survive. Icelandic in general is considered one of the more complex languages in Europe. Will it have to compromise in order to serve Icelandic residents in the future? Would that create, would that create a rift between past and present with disastrous effects for Icelandic culture? While we digest these questions and sometimes shrink from facing them head on, the teachers at our creative writing program stick to the belief that Icelandic reality can still be rendered most authentically in the medium that is the Icelandic language. Like rangers in a national park, we stay on the watch knowing that there is a whole world at stake. So this is the end of the first part. Should we, should we make a, a stop there and um, allow questions or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eh, justamente porque, bueno, es, es una plática ya muy coherente eh, en sí misma y hay personas que ya se van a ir, aunque estaba programada esta plática para de dos, bueno, el proceso de dos horas, eh, creo que es muy, muy evidente que muchos ya no van a estar acá, entonces eh, preferimos, I, I would prefer, si aprovechamos la presencia de Elif, Lara, que nos va a hablar en español, y eh, hacer un poco los puentes, los comentarios, cómo se ve lo que dice Runar desde México. Obviamente, yo lo pienso, trabajo con lenguas indígenas, estoy pensando en muchas, hay muchas re, refer, reverberaciones, implicaciones de lo que nos está diciendo Runar. Entonces, eh, yo diría, y si hay tiempo, ya nos puede platicar la segunda parte que es más. It's more literary, right? This one. Yeah, more literary. It's more literary to give you uh, a feel for the, the literature itself and the creative process. But I would uh, say, I would like to, Elif, to listen to Elif. ¿Quién va a hablar en español? Perdón. Es como, oye, perdón, es un comentario al margen. Hoy en día hay esta cosa de sexualidad fluida. Cinco minutos uno es mujer y luego cinco minutos uno es hombre. Bueno, <ríe> así me voy de una lengua a otra. <ríe> Adelante. Muchas gracias. ¿Me escuchan bien? Bueno, voy a hacer también esto fluido. Eh, inglés, español, islandés, no, porque no, no, lo, no lo conozco. Um, Voy a preguntar primero, después lo, en primero en español, luego en inglés. Um, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo quieres? Sí. Well, uh, mi primera pregunta es sobre, ya que usted es traductor, uh, my first question is that, um, so long as you are a, a, a very well-known uh, translator from other languages mm -hmm. to Icelandic languages, 
ya que usted es traductor de eh, otras lenguas al islandés. Uh, what is importance? ¿Cuál es la importancia uh, of uh, translating other um, other literatures, other examples of uh, of books of of literary uh, genders from other uh, languages into Icelandic? in order to give, uh, to consolidate uh, Icelandic uh, language. I don't know if, if, if I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit clear. Lo que le pregunto es que, ¿cuál es la importancia para consolidar el islandés de tra hacer traducciones eh, al islandés de otras lenguas? And I'm asking this because in Mexico, uh, there have been translations from uh, to uh, indigenous languages, of uh, classics of the universal literature. Mm -hmm. eh, le estoy diciendo que, bueno, en, en lenguas indígenas ha habido traducciones de clásicos de la literatura mundial, por ejemplo, El Principito, por ejemplo, uh, Le Petit Prince, uh, I don't know if it's correct from, yeah, you know this book, it has been translated to uh, indigenous languages as a strategy, como una estrategia para consolidar, to consolidate and to give prestige, to, y para dar cierto prestigio uh, to indigenous languages uh, that are also in uh, danger of extinction, que también están en peligro de extinción. Como, how do, do, uh, is this, uh, uh, well, that's a question. Uh, do you think it's a good strategy to uh, consolidate Icelandic language, uh, to keep translating? Uh, uh, literature from other nations? Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. And, and by the way, my, my wife who sits there, she, I think she, she, she has been trying to buy a copy of the, of the prince, the little prince, uh, in, in every country that she has gone to. So, uh, um, but uh, yeah, as I, I'm often asked because I primarily translate from English. So I sometimes translate a little bit from Scandinavian languages, but I'm primarily translating from English and people ask me, why are you bothering to translate from English when everyone understands English and people even seem to be on the way to become bilingual? Mm -hmm. And I reply, usually reply that uh, <clears throat> it's all the more important to translate from English. Because all the way, all the way, otherwise we would just incorporate the expressions from the English language directly into Icelandic. And um, still, Icelanders are better at Icelandic than, than English. So when I translate very difficult authors like William Faulkner, um, we're, not everything has been translated. Yes, I suppose I suppose he's been translated. Most of his work has been translated into Spanish, a big yes. language. But uh, <clears throat> we're a bit behind in this, so I've, I've been trying to catch up. Uh, people tell me that they, they have tried to read some of his uh, work in English, like As I Lay Dying and, and others, and they have given up. Then my translation, Icelandic translation, appeared, and they managed to get through it in Icelandic. Of course, and that's debatable, of course, but uh, translations have a tendency to be a bit simplified mm -hmm. because you have to explain certain things, and it's difficult to replicate everything <clears throat> in the original and, and find the way to... Uh, create an experience that is similar to the experience of the native reader of, of uh, English. But anyway, I think it's hugely important that we keep translating because that keeps uh, Icelandic alive. Translators, they have to often coin new words. Um, it's often their role to find new words for new things out there in the world. Um, that's that's one thing, and they bring the world to Iceland. So I think if we stop translating, that would have a serious impact on <clears throat> the livelihood of the Icelandic language in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, I totally agree. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo. Y esa es la lógica. That is the logic 
of translating uh, uh, universal classics to uh, um, indigenous language. Es el, el mismo objetivo de, de traducir estos clásicos universales a, a lenguas indígenas, ¿no? Que es un proceso que, pues, ahí va lento, pero ahí va, ¿no? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a process that is a, a working, uh, in a working process, but it's a little bit slow in Mexico, but it's going mm -hmm. on little by little. Now, I have another question, if, uh, if I may. Um, I have, uh, I know that there are many, for example, Filipino immigrants in Iceland. Uh, I think that, uh, que ahora hay, hay mucha migración de Filipinas, por ejemplo, en, en Islandia. That's only an example, solo es un, es un ejemplo. In your experience, uh, as a creative writing professor, en su experiencia como profesor de, de escritura creativa, uh, how your um, examples, how the texts that have been produced in, in, in your workshop, como los textos que han sido producidos en su taller, uh, has reflected the multicultural reality of Iceland. Como reflejan estos textos la realidad multicultural de, de Islandia? Uh, do they reflect it or do they tend to escape to, the, to the, this glorious past that the sagas uh, uh, has, uh, uh, well, tend to represent? Eh, le pregunto esto, si, si, si se, se están acercando estos textos en islandés eh, contemporáneos a la realidad multicultural, o más bien se basan ¿no? en las historias de las sagas medievales. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think uh, we do a good job so far of representing Filipinos oh. and their culture in, in Iceland or other cultures so far. However, um, there is, a, is an awakening now because uh, there are more and more immigrants starting to write in in Icelandic and Icelanders they have been well received extremely well received in in Iceland uh, whether it be Polish or or, or or Russian or well we don't have any Filipino uh, writers I think yeah their language is very different from ours so I, I think it's a bit harder from for them um we have also we have quite a bit of refugees lately oh. and um <clears throat> we're just beginning to try to deal with all these uh well minorities there's, there's still minorities and then this new makeup of the nation um i've written quite a bit about it and and at least one of my books has has dealt with what it means to be an Icelandic immigrants in, in other countries, for example, Australia, where I lived for a while, and the US. So I've been trying to deal with it. And 20 years ago, I tried to point out to the Icelandic nation uh, that they had to decide soon how they wanted to accommodate uh, uh, people from other countries. Yes. Uh, do they want to do it in the same vein as the Americans, the melting pot, where you basically adjust to what's there? And, uh, or the mosaic, where you, in, in Canada, where you, you get to uh, keep some of your characteristics. So the, these are very different uh, views of how to accommodate foreigners. Uh, the, the French still adhere to monolingualism that everyone you know should uh, adjust to their culture these are important questions and the way you answer them decides or has, has a lot to do with how you welcome people and the measures you implement to measure people so in short i don't think icelandic literature uh, reflects reflects the, the multicultural makeup of the society because it's still so new. But we are beginning to deal with it. My students are beginning to deal with it. Oh, thank you. That's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. This es is a phenomenon muy, muy interesante, como nos comenta el profesor, que eh, apenas ¿no? los nuevos escritores están abriendo a, a esta realidad eh, multicultural nueva también en, en, en Islandia. Um, let, let me uh, ask you um, another question and then we can 
luego le damos la palabra a los demás, un poco de monopolio, a little bit of monopolizing this. Um, what is the impact of, of literature uh, in Icelandic society? Uh, because you uh, tell, has told us that uh, you are not likely to sell more than 15,000 15, copies of a book, no? Uh, le estoy preguntando cuál es el impacto de la literatura en, en la sociedad islandesa, ¿no? Uh, and, and, and I think this is a, a, an important question in order to, to define the objectives of, of, a, literature, uh, of a literature workshop. Mm -hmm. Creo que es importante eh, tener esto en cuenta, ¿no? El impacto de la literatura en la sociedad para, eh, islandesa para definir bien los objetivos de un taller de, de escritura. Uh, what is your, your opinion that a slime, uh, Icelandic society uh, reads a lot of Icelandic literature or they are increasing uh, uh, their rate of lecture or do you think there's more to be done? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, uh, literature has had a central role in Icelandic society for a long time, and it's very important in the, for the way we define ourselves. We always or, or so often refer back to the Icelandic sagas, as I, as I said, but um, yeah, and for the, for the longest time when I was growing up, uh, literature was very central to Icelandic culture. Okay. Very central, and we have a phenomenon, phenomenon that we call the book flood. Book flood. Book flood. Christmas book flood, which is always in the in the fall. You know, most publishers publish their books in the fall, and uh, Icelanders buy them as Christmas presents. Books as yeah. Christmas presents. Yeah, books are still the most popular Christmas present in Iceland. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so that's very, very important. Uh, on the other hand, that means that people are buying books for others who may or may not read them. Yes. They don't buy as many books for themselves, maybe, although that is increasing. Yeah, like a gift for, like yeah. a Christmas gift. Mm -hmm. Now here we 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 gave uh, horrible sweaters in <laughs> Christmas. Well, we do that too, but you know. <laughs> This, this, is, this is something that keeps the Icelandic publishing industry probably alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the number of books sold, um, I, I don't know if it has gone down, but it's, uh, proportionally it's not, not gone up in recent years because we have more Icelanders than we used to. It's still, still very strong, still very going very strong, and it's very important that we keep publishing books in Icelandic and the government is very, very well aware of that and has recently been introducing uh, more subsidies, especially now recently for children's books, because there is a lack of uh, entertainment for kids. And that's one of the reasons they, they learn. So they pick up so much English from television, computer mm. games and start uh, playing in English in, in kindergarten. So we're trying to do something to stop it and we're trying to implement also digital measures. Uh, recently, a company called Storytel started uh, operating in Iceland. That's, uh, that's an, they sell audiobooks. Audiobooks. Yeah, <clears throat> which means that um, uh, some, pe some, some people who used to read books now prefer to listen to them. So that makes it in, in some way even more difficult to be uh, a conventional publisher in Icelandic and to be able to sell enough books. So uh, yeah, I think it's still quite central, but we have moved a little, little bit more towards the, the, the visual arts and then I'm talking about television, television series that everyone is watching yeah, of all over the world nowadays. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, es, es un buen ejemplo esto de los regalos de libros, ¿no? Este, 
espero que lo hagamos esta vez, ¿no? Este, con libros de la UNAM. I, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that we should uh, give as a gift, uh, for Christmas gifts, uh, the books that are produced in our university. Yes. Uh, that would be a great idea. Eso sería una, 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 una muy buena idea. Uh, and finally, um, well, there are many, many questions. Uh, is there are any, uh, well, I think it's very difficult, but is there a, any examples uh, of Icelandic uh, texts that are, has, or that has been written, written, they can see the scriptures, uh, in an, I don't know how to say it, a uh, hybrid uh, language, you know, English, Icelandic, mm -hmm. or uh, something like that. Uh, le estoy preguntando si hay ejemplos de literatura islandesa que utiliza un, un lenguaje híbrido. Yes, I'm thinking uh, that I, I'm asking you this because yeah. uh, here in, in in the United States, well, there in the in the, in the States, uh, we got some examples of Chicano literature, literature yeah. that is, mm -hmm. has been written uh, by uh, American writers from uh, Mexican mm -hmm. origin, like Sandra Cisneros. Maybe? Yes, like mm -hmm. Sandra Cisneros and many others, mm -hmm. and they also they many of them uh, use a uh, minglet language in order to to express themselves mm -hmm. oh of course that's uh that's an expression of a uh, mm -hmm. multicultural reality that they live on mm -hmm. is there any examples in icelandic literature or 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 written by uh icelandic uh immigrants in the united states uh that uh, uh write uh in this um mixed in this mixed uh language or there aren't as as far as you know you mean whether immigrant writers are start are, are doing that uh, yes um well i i i don't recall that because they want to want to want the work to be imperfect icelandic as i said in in the lecture and and that's probably due to pressure they feel from the icelandic publishing industry uh the publishing industry is still quite conservative Oh yeah. So they they want uh, to use the classical Icelandic, where there are very few uh, loan words. Mm. Um, if there are loan words, they are adjusted to the Icelandic grammatical system. Uh, but usually, we try to coin words uh, like he helicopter is thirdla in Icelandic. That's onomatopoeia, thirdla. Instead of using helicopter, yeah, you we say thirdla. Thirdla. Yeah. yeah. So the publishing industry is con conservative in this respect, but there is a widening gap between the written and the spoken language in the oh, country. Okay. So sooner or later, the, this dam will burst, okay. I think. Um, we're beginning to see some of my students, uh, we're beginning to see them use a lot of English words thrown into their texts because they feel uh, that they can't uh, do justice to their characters if they have young characters without uh, throwing these English words in because that's how they talk. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. the, this is uh, something analogous. It is a phenomenon analogo. This is something that also happens uh, as far as I know when you translate uh, to an indigenous language. Because in the indigenous language, there are many variants. There are many differences between if you, you, you want to translate one of your books to uh, Sotzil, for example, that, uh, that's a, a Chiapas language. So if you traducir un texto a Sotzil, it's not, as, it's not as easy as you think because there are many variants. It's not the same at Sotzil, it's not the same Sotzil language, no es, la, es, no es el mismo Sotzil en, en un pueblo o en otro, in, in one city or uh, in another town, there are many variants of this mm -hmm. Sotzil, and you have to, to accord yeah. uh, how to write it, and there's a special phenomenon, and, and I, hay un fenómeno especial that I have learned from one of my students, que yo aprendí de uno de mis estudiantes, that is making a thesis on this, on this subject. Tengo un alumno que hace un la tesis sobre este tema. How to represent foreign ideas or foreign words to uh, just put it in Spanish, to write it on uh, uh, in Spanish just like that, mm -hmm. or to use a, 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 a simul, to, to, to use a similar word 
but uh, from mm -hmm. indigenous origin. Yeah. Te digo que a veces este, es un problema que aprendí de un alumno que está haciendo una tesis sobre esto, eh, cómo traduce eh, al sotzil, por ejemplo, una palabra eh, eh, que no tiene un equivalente al sotzil. Si lo pones tal cual, por ejemplo, helicóptero, helicóptero o buscas un equivalente sotzil, pero no es, no es sencillo, es un gran problema, ¿sí? So that also, also happens in, in our endangered language. And, and the last uh, question, but this is a, a really personal question because with Professor Aileen, we were talking about, uh, well, she informed me, le digo que va a ser una pregunta más, más simple. La maestra Aileen me estuvo platicando de that uh, there are many crime novels in Iceland that this is a boom of crime novels. Le digo que hay, hay un boom de novela policiaca en islandés. And I have already in my Kindle uh, library, tengo en mi biblioteca Kindle algunas que estoy leyendo. For example. Yeah, I know this author. Yes. yes. He's uh, well, very popular in Iceland now. Young and upcoming crime fiction writer. But uh, 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 Professor Aileen was right. I uh, entered to Amazon and there are many, many, many... Uh, Uh, crime uh, novels mm -hmm. uh, written in Iceland, uh, what, uh, that, are, that are right now translated to Spanish. Hay un montón de novelas policíacas este, en, en, eh, ya traducidas al español de autores eh, islandeses. And uh, Professor Aileen, me, la profesora Aileen, uh, make a, a, a good observation. Why? Because in Iceland is uh, you have only 300,000 people and it's a very safe country. And I want to ask you uh, before, uh, Professor Aileen, yeah. why you are so obsessed yeah. with crime uh, with crime stories? Yeah, you you should ask the whole Icelandic nation this. I, I, it must be because we often we you... statistically there is. Uh, and let's hope that it, we keep it that way. One murder per year. Please keep it that way. But but the blood that comes from the 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 police, the thrillers, is just amazing. Another one, yeah. and there are many, many. If, if, if you look, one. si ustedes buscan en Amazon eh, libros eh, islandeses, aparecen las sagas y un montón de novelas policíacas. If you go to Amazon and, and you look for Icelandic literature, mm -hmm. you find, of course, the sagas yes. and all these thrillers. Yes. And yeah. yes, as, as Professor Elin, I, I agree that it's surprising. It's very surprising because we are usually rated as the most peaceful nation on earth. <laughs> yes. So that must be why, you know, we're so bored. <laughs> that must be why. But, uh, you know, uh, Probably it, started, it only started like 20 years ago, and it probably started because there was a, a lack of uh, books, sort of entertaining books for the general public. We had a lot of literary authors um, that that were, you know, appreciated and sold well. But when they figured out how to how to write crime fiction, entertaining crime fiction. Uh, The whole nation jumped on them, you know, and hasn't stopped reading them since. And they're, they're being sold all, all over the world, you know. I was in South Africa not so long ago and saw that, that Indre that's one that you showed me. He was there on the, on the first shelf of the bookstore when, when I entered. So we discussed this a lot in Iceland and uh, no one understands it. No, I don't. Uh, perhaps it's because they they use well-known uh, conventions of structuring stories, and maybe there was a lack of that in Iceland. So Icelandic people were glad when they could pick up a book with well-known story structures, you know, yes, with yes. happy endings often, not always. Um, and we all also ask, uh, is this... Uh, I don't know, we have a phrase for it, Icelandic, is this real literature, is this sophisticated literature or, or not? And it depends. Uh, some of the other writers, the more literary writers, they're a bit bitter. 
because they blame the crime writers for, for having stolen all the sales from them. Well, what? <laughs> <laughs> what the, yeah. yeah, that's a crime. Yeah, that's a crime. That's to a steal crime. All the sales. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Tenemos algunos comentarios en línea y también eh, preguntas. Quizá podemos alternar. Tengo dos o tres en línea. Entonces, alternar una pregunta y un eh, presencial y uno en línea. Si usted quisiera comentar algo. Yeah, I think it would be good. Well, hello, I'm Dr. Emma Julieta Barreiro. I work here in the translation department and thank you for your talk. And as well, thank you for the comments of Professor Lara Storia that actually <laughs> many of my questions you actually um, have already you know, asked um, Professor Heider. Um, um, but my, my first question or comment is about this issue of uh, crime literature because I, I, one of the courses I teach here is translation German into Spanish and as well backwards into English, Spanish, English. But uh, we are translating uh, one the, in the class of literary uh, courses, uh, trans literary translation courses. Uh, we are working with, uh, with crime novels chosen by my German colleague because I'm not a crime uh, fiction reader. And then I asked my students uh, if they were crime literature readers, and some of them were. And I know that in Germany, the highest percentage of readers as well are into crime novels, right? So um, one of the, the uh, go, going to this, uh, the structure, you mentioned the, you know, um, the structure and the issue of having uh, questions to solve, you know, during the narrative. Is one of, I think, one of the main uh, attractions or the most uh, interesting uh, things that readers you know, find in this kind of literature. And uh, probably you, this is why your readers in, uh, in Iceland as well, you know, find that very attractive. But that, you know, that goes to the point of the, the border or the link between pop, um, pop culture and high culture in your. Icelandic literary tradition, because this is, I mean, you tend, I mean, your comments were like, yeah, okay, this is like um, high literature or, or literary writers, no? Look at pop fiction uh, writers like saying you are still in our readers. But is it, is it how important that is for, you know, Icelandic literature? As I, you, you mentioned the issue of perfect Icelandic language in the in you know when you want to preserve literary you know Icelandic literature you know how is that you know how is this relationship between pop literature and high literature when you think of preserving Icelandic language mm -hmm. yeah I, I think this is a main concern in yeah. how um, and then going back to this issue of the sagas right what are the sagas in the end you know, there are stories, you know, like, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, they are stories about national events you know, different. There are, of course, there's a whole classification you know, of the topics, uh, different topics in the sagas. But it's not, not the same. You no, know, I said, you know, what is this link between the first pop and high literature, you no, know, in, in the, you know, to preserve a language, a national language, you no, know, mm -hmm. and as well a public. No, you mentioned the issue of uh, published industry no? and its readers. And, and, and then, so I'm, I'm very curious you know, see, just how you kind of put together this kind of puzzle. No? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a it's, um, complicated issue because uh, nowadays, at least, Icelandic publishers need those crime writers. Otherwise, they would soon go bankrupt. So these crime writers nowadays are keeping the publishing industry alive 
and giving them a chance to publish the more literary authors. So we, we literary authors have become dependent on the sort of um, pop culture that uh, they may represent the crime writers, but I would like to <clears throat> emphasize that, of course, crime fiction can be literary fiction as well. And some authors that we call literary authors are borrowing um, from the crime authors, so sort of in, in order to be able to better approach um, uh, the general public who uh, comes home tired at night and, and doesn't doesn't have the stamina or energy to uh, to to read complicated literature uh, that re requires a lot of energy. Um, so, but I, I think both are very important to preserve the Icelandic language nowadays. Um, th there is often talk that some crime authors write very poor Icelandic, but there are others that are praised for writing quite good Icelandic, which is very important because so many people read these books. So it all contributes, I think, to preserving the Icelandic language. I'm not sure if I completely answer your question, but... It's a, it's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship, yeah. right? I'd like to now go just... I only have three comments here, so we can alternate. Alexis Salgado say, uh, says, I'd like to know how the history and mythology of Norse people have lured readers towards Icelandic literature. I think that's actually, a, in my opinion, a very relevant question because there is this aura. I've, I, you know, when people say, oh, you're Icelandic? Oh, there, there is this aura about Iceland and Icelandic literature and, you know, the whole this imaginary idea of Vikings and everything. And this knowledge, there is a, a lot of knowledge that Icelandic has preserved the, Ice, the old Norse traditions and all that. So I, I, uh, Alexis is asking a, an interesting question. So, dice, quiero saber cómo la historia y mitología de los pueblos nórdicos han atraído a los lectores hacia la literatura islandesa. Yeah, that's that's hard maybe for, for me to say whether um, the Icelandic sagas lure um, foreign readers to to Icelandic literature. Maybe, maybe to a certain extent um, we sense that in, in Germany. Um, <clears throat> Germans seem to have a certain image of Iceland, which we don't always find realistic. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if, if, they, if they lure it. Um, the, the 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 Viking issue. Uh, there's been recently a series um, called the Vikings or something. Uh, to us, that sounds uh, <clears throat> like fiction, because Icelandic scholars uh, have have recently been rewriting uh, the settlement of Iceland, and many of them believe that uh, the the people who settled Iceland were not at all Vikings, that they were just normal farmers. Um, so, yeah, and peaceful farmers who, who went to Iceland, but the, the Viking image sticks, and I guess, yeah, maybe they were fleeing from the Vikings, but uh, at least they were good seafarers, so they maybe got that from the from from the Viking culture. Um, but I, it's hard for me to say. And uh, as as far Icelanders themselves, I. I think they read less and less of the sagas. It's uh, some sagas, one or two sagas are still required reading um, in uh, in high school and elementary schools, but uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for them because they have a smaller vocabulary, the younger generations, because of all the English influence. Yeah, I Workshops. Workshops for for uh, creative writing. Uh, you described that this the case of these two Polish students wanted to develop an Icelandic voice of some sort. 
uh, on the basis of a, of a perfect Icelandic in their texts. As an instructor of these workshops, uh, well, surely you know that this uh, concept of voice has different interpretations depending voice. on the purpose of voice. Yeah, yeah the, the voice. Voice, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Has uh, multiple interpretations depending on what the purpose of a workshop is, the very purposes of the writers and so on. In your experience as an instructor there, uh, what has the change consisted on in the case of these students? What, what would you consider can be involved in this notion of voice? Mm -hmm. that help them yeah. to even get published after yeah. participating mm -hmm. in the workshops yeah that's Thank you. A, that's a good question i think uh, uh of course we as as instructors we are still learning um one of the dangers of writing workshops is that uh, you push uh people from who have a different background but you force them to adopt uh, the the Icelandic conventions, for example, and this is much debated in writers' workshops in the U.S. at the moment. And there are uh, there are authors. I, I don't know if Sandra Cisneros even has complained about this when she went to the I.O. writers' workshops that uh, she was not allowed to uh, create her own own voice there. That she was forced to uh, write like a you know middle-aged white American man probably so uh, i'm aware of these issues and we discuss them openly with these polish students in the hope that they you know we ask them what uh, approach they would like to take on this um, and it seems that in these particular cases they want to become respected as icelandic authors not as necessarily Polish Icelandic authors. And um, they, they don't want to go the way that Anja Wolwicks, the, the Australian poet, Polish poet who writes in broken English, and she writes wonderful poetry and has a, a really important message to the Australian nation, I think, about the center of Australian culture. So uh, in a way, I, I was hoping either of them would like to do something like that because that's also interesting broken icelandic can also be very interesting and have its own aesthetic just the last answer <laughs> yeah icelandic authors yes yes well they they wanted to <clears throat> To write uh, grammatical Icelandic, but uh, of course they have a different vision, uh, which is represented in the writing. The, their tone, their voice is still quite different from most Icelandic authors. So we we were conscious and and very aware of of, of the fact that we we should let them have their voice and their vision. Thank you very much. Um, here. There's a comment of Juan Pablo Escobar Farfán. ¿Qué importancia considera que tenga el desarrollo de herramientas tecnológicas tales como repositorios institucionales para la preservación y difusión de este conocimiento? How important do you consider the, the development of technological tools such as repository, institutional repositories for the preservation and diffusion of this knowledge. Well, I think that will make or break the future of <clears throat> the Icelandic language. We have to find ways to get Icelandic to uh, the kids. We have to find ways. Uh, we, we are not able, we don't have the resources to to uh, to dub, for example, all all programs uh, for kids on television. We don't have the resources to that. Uh, let alone everything that you can find on the internet. You know, we can't dub or subtitle everything on YouTube. Or, but I I think the the government has realized this and that that uh, they are putting significant funds into into uh, creating new new programs and new uh, digital resources to help us with you know uh, those who write in the bigger languages they can use a word processor 
that helps them along with spelling, you know, as they go along. We haven't been able to do that yet. There are some, some spell checkers, but they don't work with word, for example. They're, they're working on that now. So the, all, all these issues add up, and I think they're hugely important that we continue this work. Whether that will be enough, I'm not quite sure, and I'm a little bit skeptical myself, I must admit, because I see such a strong force going in the other direction. And I can also understand Iceland as young people who went, want to have opportunities all over the world. Can all, I can well understand why they think it's vital for them to have a good command of English. Maybe we can find a way to become bilingual in some, some good way, uh, rather than creating a Creole language. I don't know how this will develop, but it'll be interesting, but I'll be dead probably. Um. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I hope I'm not repeating anything that anybody else asked. I have like slightly bad hearing, but I do know a little bit what it's like to come from a nation that is being reduced a lot to cliches. Like I'm from Austria. It's a small country as well. Um, it's, and I was thinking, I used to study Icelandic at the University of Vienna, like some okay. shall good timing. We try, shall we try your Icelandic? Uh, <laughs> I'm like sadly not very <laughs> fluent anymore, but I know that there is a big, like a good deal of really, really good literature from the 20th century, but there is so little translations to even to English, not to German, to pretty close languages, let's say, you know. So I'm kind of wondering if there is any chance for future writers that don't want to hop on the train of having to reproduce cliches, crime story, well, that just because the readers want that, because that's the picture they want to see of a country, or a picture they want to paint of the country. If there is any like tendencies or chances that publishing houses, they have quite some power, no? But I know also that it's always a question of economic um, factors and money and da, da, da. But yeah, if mm. there is any ways that that can be like, a, I don't know, better ways of working together to to not lose these like unique voices um i would like some of my favorite like writers is an icelandic writer from the like 70s or something like i but it's really sad i can't share it with anyone because she's writing yeah. well of course in icelandic and she's hardly translated to any other language so mm, yeah it's a yeah. little bit my question um, in that yeah point. well uh, i think it's actually up to women uh, because they make up the majority of readers and um, buyers of books where they can find new ways of uh, you, you, of, of writing literary, literary works. Um, I myself is uh, a bit interested in, um, quite interested actually in, in seeing if we can update or revitalize the romance novels, love stories. Uh, <clears throat> which have been looked a bit down upon, uh, especially by men in recent, uh, in recent history, you know, uh, who didn't speak well of, of such books, but I, I think we, we could easily find ways of, of updating them and make them maybe a, a little bit uh, more modern and literary. That's one thing. Um, as far as translations of other books than crime fiction, into other languages, actually, you don't notice them as much because they are uh, generally not bestsellers. But uh, there's never been translated more of literary uh, works from Icelandic than in the past two decades. So you can find them, but they're often published by small publishers. Thank you. Well, it's a fascinating topic being dealt here. I'm a sociolinguist and from a different university in Mexico City, but I used to work here as a language teacher and um, in my youth as a translator as well. Um, I've, I've been working for a long time about language shift as a sociolinguist. And um, with the Spanish and indigenous languages here in Mexico, 
And uh, what I figured out really is that you have you have to have a model which doesn't just look at language. And as a matter of fact, we are all talking about more than language. And what worked for me is is a model, very simple model, to say you have to look at, at the language as such, language structure and vocabulary at the discourse level and the level of cultural models mm -hmm. that are behind yeah. these discourse models. And that worked perfectly right. And I could show with empirical material uh, that these shifts don't go along in parallel all the time. So there could be an invasion of dominant cultural models from abroad or discourse models in a language which is still spoken or written and vice versa. That uh, people um, lose our language in, in this case, or don't speak it anymore, but keep up discourse structures and cultural models uh, which are um, of their origin. Okay, so you can translate them, you mean, into another language that... that that's right, you have models. to look at the three levels. I, I, at a very young age, I dare to translate uh, the, the first Chilean novel that came out after the military coup almost 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I translated that to German, which is... that These two are my mother tongues. Okay. And that was a, uh, a novel um, developed through three autobiographies about the Chilean process of... Uh, peaceful way to socialism uh, with different sociolects. So it wasn't easy to translate. Mm -hmm. And what I arrived at with the help of, of the editors was to create kind of uh, artificial social, sociolect in German because it wouldn't have made sense to use the, the available sociolects. But, but you have to really create a new language there. Uh, of course, at that time, this was a long time ago, I hadn't really ideas I have now that you really have to look at these three levels, both in the analysis and also in questions of translation mm -hmm. or programs to to reduce language shift or yeah. even push for revitalization. So I would I would like to of course your language is very privileged in uh, compared to others. Yeah. But if you look for instance at a parallel case in somehow it could be Quebecois the Quebec, where they have tried from from for many decades now to avoid massive bilingualism within their population. Yeah, they have tried to work against it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's, uh, French is the only official language, and you keep. They are against bilingual education. For them, it's a four-letter word, you know. Uh, but this is breaking down now. You mm, go to Montreal, you see the youth doing exactly the same as. Yeah, uh, youth people in Reykjavik. Yeah, to 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 use um, whatever translanguaging is, is, yeah. is the big yeah. word right now. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Well, the the, the fact uh, what what you say about retaining the the, the culture of a, of a lost language that's that goes against what the Icelanders have believed. They have always believed that uh, there's so much uh, in the language itself. Uh, for example, uh, much of our vocabulary uh, draws on fishing. Um, would we be able to retain that somehow in another language? You know, uh, but what has actually happened in Iceland is, is I think that the attitude towards the language has changed, and that's creating um, maybe we were, we were policing the language too much. And so when we start policing the language, the, we, we talk about the language police, actually, uh, and let it go. All kinds of things happened with the language and some, some good and creative things. And, and, uh, but it's hard, it's hard for, for me, who is brought up with pure Icelandic, uh, without foreign loan words, um, to accept this, you know. Every time I, I come across this word, you know, there's, there's, there's a sitting in, 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 my, in my head that uh, goes off. Uh, but I don't know. I would really love to uh, know more about your studies about this, whether we can retain, retain the culture, even though we, we lose quite a bit of uh, the, the language. Uh, we can look at Ireland. 
which lost their iris uh, in a very short time when the iris started to, to do more business with the English. And it disappeared in maybe one or two centuries. We have lit, very little left of the iris. There, is a few, there are a few pockets where iris is, is spoken now. Um, are they any worse off? Have they lost their, um, lost their identity, their culture? In most cases, but not in all of them, the language is one of them, but yeah. it could be not. Like the, mm -hmm. like the Jewish uh, people and community, they didn't have a common language they spoke. So it was religion. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the Irish, they say it wasn't the language, but it was religion which created the identity against the English. Mm. You see? Mm -hmm. So um, when they got their liberation, their independence 100 years ago, the language was already gone. Okay. But what, what made them so strong to fight for their independence against the yeah, they, they still hate the English for very good reasons, as the Scottish do, um, it, it, it's religion which makes okay. up the, the core value of difference mm. against them. No, that's not the case with Iceland. It's not the case with Iceland. No, yeah. no, but we think because perhaps that's a delusion that you know that that our country is so special that you have to have a special language <laughs> spoken in that country but you know we'll see what happens but uh, you know i would like to read upon your theories um, i would like to start closing i think it's already almost two o'clock so um uh, I would like to thank everybody. I'm very happy to see that many people held it out. Uh, I was had already been told that there would be students leaving. Um, but thank you so much for your presence here. And there have been some people online. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias por la presencia en línea también. Y eh, va a quedar grabado. Eh, ahora conocieron a, a Runer. Do you have tra things translated into Spanish? Yeah, two short stories. <laughs> so, ajá, uh hay -huh, algunas, pero también hay traducciones al Island, al inglés, así que esperemos que puedan leer el trabajo de Runar y esperemos que sigamos este tipo de diálogos con una lengua como el islandés. Aprovecho para hacer un comercial porque también casualmente, es pura casualidad, también va a venir otra um, islandesa asociada a la Universidad de Islandia en abril, así que es casi un ciclo. Eh, ella es eh, especialista en literatura hispanoamericana y es traductora de eh, el español al islandés y, va, y su tema de, de presentación va a ser justamente los retos de la traducción del español al islandés de obra literaria. Así que, siendo la ENAL un lugar de, de donde hay también traducción, creo que será de mucho interés para muchos. Y como siempre, como, he, como dije al inicio, estamos muy agradecidos con eh, la directora, la doctora Contillo, por eh, abrir las puertas y esperamos que eh, hayan disfrutado de esta presentación y esperemos que siga el asunto. Ok, muchas gracias. Thank you.